Hi guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Jisrael Atrias, and in this video, we will discuss allowable deductions, particularly the itemized deductions and the optional center deduction. So we have been discussing already for the past few lectures that we have about gross income, about the sources of income of any taxpayer. We have discussed compensation income, business income, professional income. We also discussed passive incomes, those subjected to final taxes, like the interest, prizes, winnings, dividends, and also we have discussed capital gains. In our lecture on dealings in properties, we have classified what is an ordinary asset and what is a capital asset. So overall, we have discussed already what are those incomes added in our gross income subject to income tax. So we are now going to discuss allowable deductions, which are the items or amounts allowed by the law to be deducted from our gross income. So we have here the itemized deductions and the optional standard reduction. So if you're ready, let's start. So our lesson objectives in this topic, at the end of this lesson, you will be able to distinguish a capital expenditure from a revenue expenditure, compare itemized deductions from optional standard deduction, and identify the pertinent items allowed by the law to be deducted from the gross income, and finally, to apply the rules to the different items allowed for deduction. So before we dive into the itemized deduction and optional standard deduction, let us first compare what is a capital expenditure and what is a revenue expenditure. In a particular business setting, there are a lot of transactions which usually involve expenditures or disbursements, using of business cash or money to acquire something. So. What is the difference of a capital expenditure and a revenue expenditure? So it is said that capital expenditures are non-recurring expenditures which involves large monetary amount. This expenditure typically benefit more than one accounting period and therefore amortized or depreciated. So for example, if you acquire or construct a new building, that is a capital expenditures. Or when you acquire a large machine or equipment which will be used for the business in not just for a year but it will benefit for two or more years let's say five years that is also a capital expenditures or when you develop something like a patent or a right or you spent on the research and development of your product that is also a capital expenditures which benefit not just one year but two or more periods so there are some salient characteristics or nature of a capital expenditure first they are non-recurring meaning it does not always occur in a business or it happens once in a year or two years or in a decade number two they usually involve a large amount of money like significant amount of money not just hundreds or thousands but it could involve large amount of thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions and the third characteristic is that it benefits not only one period or one accounting period but two or more accounting period meanwhile when we say revenue expenditures these expenditures are recurring expenditures which benefit one accounting period only and are therefore expensed immediately so in contrast to capital expenditures revenue expenditures are recurring they usually involve a small amount of money and they benefit only one accounting period for example when you pay the salaries of your staff or employees or when you spend on office supplies or when you pay your utilities so those are 
recurring. You incur these expenses regularly and usually in every month. So that is a revenue expenditure. They benefit only one hunting period, therefore they are expensed immediately. So what's the difference between a capital expenditure and a revenue expenditure? Well, the treatment is not the same. Capital expenditures are normally capitalized, meaning we recognize this expenditure as an asset and we subject the asset to depreciation or amortization while the revenue expenditure is expensed immediately in the accounting period where they benefit. So that's basically the difference between the capital and revenue expenditure. So let us illustrate. We have here the first situation. Juan de la Cruz constructed a building to be used as his principal office for the practice of his profession. Among others, he spent 100000 for the installation of the light and for the painting of the entire building. How must this expenditure be treated? So, this installation of the light and painting of the entire building benefits not just only one year, but it could last for several years. And these expenses are non-recurring. Therefore, we will treat this expenditure as a capital expenditure. In situation two, we have here, to assist Juan in his laundry business, he hired Maria and pay her on a fixed monthly rate of 13,000 pesos. So, so since Maria is an employee of Juan and this 13,000 pesos is a regular monthly salary of Maria, therefore, this 13,000 expenditure is a revenue expenditure. In fact, it only benefits one month, short term. Hence, we classify this as revenue expenditure. Now that you have already the idea of what is a capital expenditure and a revenue expenditure, let us focus our discussion more. Let us now focus our discussion more on the revenue expenditure. So, we will first distinguish again what is an exclusion and what is a deduction. A lot of students and taxpayers have struggled in classifying what is an exclusion and what is a deduction when it is actually obvious what an exclusion means and what a deduction means so the term exclusions refers to those pertinent items which are specifically mentioned by section 32b as exclusions from the gross income as they are exempt from taxation recall that in our previous video lecture we have already discussed what are those items specifically mentioned by the tax code under section 32b which are excluded from the gross income because they are actually not subject to tax like the proceeds of life insurance or retirement benefits so we have already mentioned what are those items which are actually not subject to income tax and they are considered as exclusions meaning excluded from the gross income on the other hand the term deductions are those pertinent items which are provided by section 34 of the tax code so deductions are those specific items which can be deducted from our gross income they are not exclusions when we say exclusions these are the items not subject to tax and hence they are not added to our gross income they are actually excluded from our gross income subject to tax but when we say deductions these are the items allowed by the law to be deducted from our gross income they could be itemized or the optional standard deductions so we have here a performa income tax return so we have sales or service revenue sales revenue if you are engaged into selling of goods and service revenue if you are into into selling of service for example when you are practicing a profession minus cost of sales or service then we will get gross operating income so this is the gross income from our business meaning the sales or the revenue less the cost of sales or cost of service. So after we derive the gross operating income, we will add the other than operating income. 
this other than operating income or the incomes which are not subject to final tax, like the passive incomes and the capital gains which are not subjected to a final tax or a capital gains tax. As we have mentioned in our previous video lectures, generally speaking, passive incomes like interest, dividends, prizes, winnings, royalties are subject to final tax when they are earned in the Philippines. However, there are passive incomes which are also not subjected to a final tax. And these passive incomes are added to our gross income. Meanwhile, capital gains arising from the sale of real properties and sale of shares of stocks, which are unlisted in the local stock exchange, they are subject to capital gains tax. But when the capital gains are not subjected to a capital gains tax, which is a final tax, these gains are also added to our gross income under the other than operating income. Also, those items which are specifically exempted by the law, like the retirement benefits or the proceeds of life insurance, these items are excluded, meaning they are never added to our gross income. Okay? So after we have combined all other than operating income, we will add this together to our gross operating income to get the total gross income. And from then, we will deduct the allowable deductions to get the net taxable income. So if you notice, the items which are excluded from the gross income or the exclusions are never added to our gross income. While the allowable deductions, these are the items which are allowed by the law to be deducted from our gross income. And this is our topic in this video. So what is an allowable deduction? These are the items or charges against the gross income claimed by the taxpayer arising from the conduct of business or from the practice of profession. Generally speaking, in accounting, these items are called expenses to derive our accounting income but for taxation purposes we call these items as allowable deductions because there are certain rules on how you would deduct these items from our gross income these items include expenses whether incurred or paid which are allowed by the law to be deducted from his or its gross income before imposing the corresponding income tax. And take note that only those self-employed taxpayers or those having business may deduct pertinent items from their gross income to arrive at a net taxable income. Those employed, meaning working as an employee, they cannot deduct these items from their gross income because only those taxpayers who are engaged into business who are self-employed or practicing their profession may deduct these items from their gross income compensation income earners and passive income earners who are subject to final tax cannot deduct their expenses unless they have business income from which business expenses may be charged against so we have here general rules on claiming deductions Deductions from gross income can only be allowed if it is necessary, ordinary, and substantiated. So this is in accordance with the strictissimi juris, which requires taxpayer claiming for exemption or deductions to substantiate their claims, meaning to present evidence of their entitlement to those expenses or those items claimed as deductions. So what do we mean by necessary when you say necessary these are items which are needed for business for example if you are having a sarisari store or a small carinderia and you need an assistance because you cannot do the things all by yourself alone so you would hire persons to assist you and you would pay them for a fixed or a minimum wage that is a necessary expense it is for the business it is needed for your business so salaries 
is a necessary expense for a business. And when we say ordinary, this is usual for business. Is it usual for someone having business to hire another people to work for him? Yes, of course. So when you pay someone for his or her salary, that is ordinary because it is needed and it is usual for your business. The item or the expense must be substantiated. What do you mean by substantiated? What is the substantiation requirements? It means that when you pay something, you should be able to present evidence that you have really disbursed this amount. Okay, so this must be supported with official receipts and invoices. So for example, if you are engaged into merchandising business and you have an office for the administrative work and you bought office supplies are these office supplies necessary for your business of course you need these office supplies to print up reports is this usual for that kind of business the merchandising business to purchase office supplies of course they are usual hence they are called office supplies is that substantiated can you present official receipts or invoices that you really acquire those office supplies? If yes, then that means you have substantiated the expense. So when claiming an expense or an item to be deducted from your gross income, always consider these three general requirements. The expense must be necessary, it must be ordinary, and it must be substantiated. Deductions depend upon the taxpayer's residence, citizenship, and his source of income. Always remember this that the, the sources of income must match with the sources of the deduction. If your gross income is from the Philippines, then you can only deduct those expenses which are incurred in the Philippines. If the sources of your income is from abroad or outside the Philippines, then you are allowed to claim deductions from expenses incurred outside the Philippines, provided that you are a resident citizen or a domestic corporation. If your source of income is only from the Philippines and you have expenses outside the Philippines, you cannot deduct those items as you don't have income sources from abroad. A taxpayer seeking a deduction must ascertain his entitlement to such deduction by pointing specific provisions of the statute or the law authorizing the deduction. So always remember that when you claim deductions, you should know that these deductions are specifically provided by the law to be exempted from your gross income, meaning you cannot deduct items or expenses which are not provided in our law. And also, the taxpayer must prove that he is entitled to the deduction authorized or allowed, especially in cases under dispute. In the absence of a law authorizing or granting such deduction or exemption, taxpayer cannot deduct such amount of charges claimed against his gross income. So, when you are the taxpayer and you are claiming for deductions, you must first know that these items are actually provided in the law to be deducted from the gross income. Second, you must, you must prove that you are entitled to such deductions. That's why we have a substantiation rule. You need to substantiate, you need to provide evidence to provide source documents like invoices and official receipts so that you can claim for deductions. A lot of questions in practice involve taxpayers asking whether or not they are allowed to claim deductions for expenses evidenced only by acknowledgement receipt or delivery receipt. Well, acknowledgement receipt and delivery receipt are actually secondary or supplementary evidences. The BAR, the Bureau of Internal Revenue in our law, requires that when you claim for expenses, these expenses must be substantiated and evidenced by an official receipt or an invoice. Official receipts are 
normally issued when you purchase a service like when you pay professional fees while invoices are issued to you when you are purchasing goods for example office supplies so these are the two things or two documentary evidences that are required by the bureau of internal revenue to prove your claim for those expenses otherwise these expenses may be voided if not supported with official receipts or invoices if we have a general rule we also have exemption to the rule in the case of claiming optional sender deduction which we will discuss in our other video, the taxpayer may not need to substantiate the deductions. So that substantiation rule applies only if you are claiming for itemized deductions. But if you are claiming optional standard deduction, you need not substantiate the deduction because this is a standard deduction of 40%, which we will discuss in our other video. And I will link that video here. So there are two types of allowable deductions. A taxpayer engaged in business or practice of profession may choose one of the following. The ITMIC deduction, which is the default, and optional sender deduction or OSD. So from our gross income, we can deduct or any taxpayer can deduct ITMIC deductions or optional standard deduction. So our default deduction is itemized deduction, meaning when the taxpayer failed to elect the OSD or optional standard deduction, then automatically he is claiming for itemized deductions in which he is required to present evidence to support his claim like the official receipts or invoices. Whereas when a taxpayer chooses the optional standard deduction or OSD, he is not required to present those evidences. In this video, we will compare the ITMI deduction and the optional standard deduction. We are not going to discuss the items, the, the detailed of the items for ITMI deductions, nor discuss the optional standard deduction in this video. We will just compare the ITMI in the OSD because we will have another videos for those items okay so let us now compare and contrast the itemized deduction and the optional standard deduction what is an itemized deduction so an itemized deduction these are the items provided by section 34 of the tax code so what are these deductions well as provided by section 34 of our tax code there are only 10 items which can be deducted from our gross income and we can easily memorize these items using this abbreviation exenta loba dep dep chargebet so actually i have these mnemonics when i was in college way back 2012 i think so to make it easier for me to memorize those items i found these mnemonics very helpful and it's easier to memorize the 10 items Exenta Loba Dep Dep Chart Bet, which stands for expenses, interest, taxes, losses, bad debts, depreciation, depletion, charitable contribution, research and development, and pension trusts. So those are the 11 items which are specifically provided by Section 34 classified as itemized deductions. Try it. Exenta loba, dep dep chart bet. Expenses, interest, taxes, losses, bad debts, depreciation, depletion, charitable contribution, research and development, pension trust. Those are the 10 items. So these items are the 10 itemized deductions which may be claimed by the taxpayer if these items apply to him. However, if the, if the taxpayer cannot provide evidence or cannot substantiate these items or if the taxpayer thinks that he would save taxes if he would not claim these items, then maybe the optional standard deduction is good for him. The optional standard deduction, in lieu of the itemized deductions, the taxpayer may elect 
a 40% standard deduction. So currently, when the taxpayer cannot substantiate the items for deductions, meaning he cannot provide evidence or has no official receipts or invoices, or if he thinks that he would save, it would save him from paying taxes to claim OSD, then he can claim OSD, the 40% OSD, which is 40% of his gross income if the taxpayer is a domestic corporation or if a corporation, or 40% of his gross sales or receipts if the taxpayer is an individual taxpayer. We will discuss the details of the OSD in our other videos so that you can compare the individual and the corporate taxpayer. But remember that the intention to claim OSD is not presumed as it is only optional. Meaning if the taxpayer wants to claim OSD, then he must do so. He must choose to elect OSD in his first income tax return in 1701Q for the first quarter because if he failed to claim OSD during the first quarter then it is automatic that he is claiming for itemized deductions for the rest of the year. The taxpayer should signify his intention to claim OSD during the filing of the first quarterly return by marking X the box indicating OSD, and such election would be irrevocable for the taxable year in which the return is paid. Thus, in the next taxable year, the taxpayer shall elect again whether to choose OSD or the itemized deduction. So we have here an example of erroneous election of deductions. So for the first quarter, under the second row, the taxpayer elects OSD. But for the second quarter, he elects itemized deduction. This is wrong because if you claim OSD during the first quarter, you should select OSD again in the second, third, and annual return. We also have here in the third row, the taxpayer claimed itemized deductions. And in the second quarter, he claimed OSD. Again, this is wrong because you or the taxpayer, when he claimed for OSD or itemized deduction for the first quarter, he should do the same for the second, third, and annual return. So this example is an erroneous election of deductions. We also have here the example of correct election of deductions. So the taxpayer under the second row elects OSD in the first quarter. Then he is going to elect the OSD for the rest of the year, for the rest of the taxable year. He cannot shift the claiming of deduction from OSD to itemized deduction for a year. Meaning, if the taxpayer claimed for OSD in the first quarter, then he would do the same for the rest of the year. If the taxpayer under the third row claimed itemized deduction for the first quarter, then he would do the same for the rest of the year. He cannot change from OSD to itemized or vice versa from quarter to quarter. He must be consistent in the application of deductions. For the next year, he can again choose whether OSD or itemized deduction. Okay? The failure to elect OSD shall be considered as having availed the itemized deductions because again, the itemized deduction is a default selection. So, in the first quarter, if the taxpayer failed to mark X the OSD or failed to select OSD by marking X, then it is as if he is claiming or having availed the itemized deduction for the rest of the year. That's it. I hope you learned a lot from this video and also please watch the other video for the detailed discussions about itemized deductions and OST. Thank you so much for watching.